Hey guys, and welcome to today's episode of Give It The Beans. Now, it is my absolute pleasure and honour to introduce a man who has been giving it the beans for a very, very long time. It is the one and only John Meadows. How are we doing, buddy? I'm good, thank you. Wicked, listen, it's, it's an absolute honour to have you on, and I'm sure that the listeners out there that have well, well seasoned within bodybuilding are buzzing to hear about you, but there's also a lot of listeners out there that perhaps we, we that don't know much about bodybuilding itself, so I thought this would be a great opportunity, um, and I don't want you to make it brief, I want you to give us the whole shebang of an introduction to who you are, your career within bodybuilding, the history, um, right up to right from the start to now, if you could. <laughs> That's a long answer. <laughs> I'm sure they want to hear it. Well, I um, I was a little unique in the fact that I loved bodybuilding at a very young age. So I competed in my first contest at 13 years old. Wow. And um, I competed in, I think I stopped counting around 60, 70 contests. <laughs> um, I, I didn't win my pro card until my, I think it was my 16th pro qualifier. Wow. I don't know anybody else has kind of had that journey quite like me. So it took a lot of second places and coming back and second place and come back. Sometimes I didn't even make the top 15. Yeah. Um, I, I uh, got my pro card uh, five years ago and I competed in 11 pro contests right, right real quickly in the first couple of years and um, did well as a pro. And I haven't competed uh, since 2017. I'm 48 uh, now. Uh, my story is a little interesting, as you mentioned, though, because I really worked in the corporate world for most of my life. Uh, I ran projects for a corporation named J.P. Morgan Chase and uh, ran some actually quite large projects. And I really was in that corporate world for most of my life, and bodybuilding was just a hobby. So, you know, I'd leave work a little early on a Friday, go fly somewhere and compete, fly home on Sunday night, Monday I was back to work. Like, okay, that was fun. Yeah. Now back to, the, back to the real world. Yeah. Um, I didn't leave the corporate world until about eight years ago, and I've been focusing on kind of this industry ever since. I own a supplement company called Granite Supplements. I, um, I have two kids. I have twin boys that are 11 years old. And, um, you know, my wife and I, we keep very, very busy. We're, we're involved in all kinds of stuff. I, I actually coach American football. I'm not sure if you call football over there, American football. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, so I've got a lot going on. Um, I still, I still do some coaching and bodybuilding and I have a web, my website, I have a YouTube. We actually just hit 400,000 subscribers yesterday. In fact, so a lot going on over here. Absolutely. I mean, here's me saying, I think my web, uh, my YouTube's got about 250, <laughs> 100, <laughs> not 1,000, but you, you truly are a seasoned competitor. And I think that you've probably seen the, the game change a lot over the years. But before we kind of get into that, I think a lot of people will know you through the Mountain Dog Diet, as well as obviously your, your sort of grand set of supplements. So for those that maybe perhaps don't know too much about what Mountain Dog is all about, um, do you want us to give us a bit more info on that? Well, you know, originally um, I was on forums, you know, just conversing and talking with people. And I'm a big lover of Bernese Mountain Dogs. I'm not sure if you guys have a lot of Bernese Mountain Dogs in Scotland, but I'm not too sure. I, I love them. It's a beautiful dog. And um, I, I actually, my first one, I actually used to take the contest. Like I used to show her. She was a show dog. Right. So I love Bernese Mountain Dogs. So I always went under the name Mountain Dog One on the forums just referring to the, my love for the dog. So I, I kept talking about, here's what I think about training. Here's what I think about eating. And people started calling that kind of the mountain dog philosophy, which was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the train, the nutrition stuff, I wrote it, I wrote a, a forum article, man, years ago, it's probably been 13, 14 years ago. And I basically outlined what I thought of just eating in general and I remember saying, you, you know, there's an old saying, you, you are what you eat. And I said, you are what you eat has eaten. So kind of take it a step further. And we really look for, um, you know, like, like grass fed meats and wild caught fish and things like that. 
Um, and I talked about the importance of balanced diets. I'm, I'm not a fan of eliminating macronutrients for the long term. You know, I, I'm not a fan of zero carb diets or zero fat diets for the long term. I mean, they have their utility if you're, you're doing something short term. But just as a general eating philosophy, like, or maybe you have a health condition, maybe maybe you have to do something. But just in general, I wrote about having how having a balanced diet with the right food sources was um, was very important. And now to me, it's kind of common sense. Like that shouldn't be like rocket science to people. But a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, wow, I never thought of that. And um, and which was kind of bizarre to me. Um, and and then you know, in in terms of training, I talked about how to structure workouts, not only from an intensity perspective, but from a longevity perspective, because, you know, there's not many people that continue to train hard um, after 10, 20, 30 years of training. You know, a lot of people get injured, major injuries. A lot of people have, they develop all kinds of issues with their hips, with their spine, just all kinds of issues as they get older. They don't really kind of consider the longevity part of it. You know, they're fired up, they're you know, they want to train really hard, which I love, but you got to kind of do it smart. So I laid out ways and to sequence exercises and to when to do certain things and how, how much of the high intensity stuff she did you, et cetera. So I kind of, over the years, refined that over many, many, many years, I, I still try to find ways to fine tune the training and make it better. But um, I spent many, many years trying to understand how can I work hard, be efficient, and stay healthy? And um, that's really what my training is all about. It's how to work really hard, but do it in a really intelligent manner, right? Yeah. So um, I, I love that. And I think that bodybuilding or bodybuilders themselves usually get a bad rep that we're all just meatheads. We like just fucking pounding the weights, and we're not necessarily thinking about everything that you've just described. But what it sounds like is that you are kind of putting someone's health at the forefront of your decision making and what they do because I would agree with you if, if I can't hack squat in the next 20 years I will be one sad individual because <laughs> it's something I love doing but that, that's certainly something that you have preached over the years and something that is becoming over here in the UK certainly like at the forefront of everybody's mind is about this longevity side of things but what I want to ask you about so if we span sort of your career and we go back to the start, which I, which I think was about the, the late 1990s, if I'm right. I know you competed when you were 13. Um, but could you kind of talk us through what was things like then with that same thought process? Was it a case of, you know, was, were people training with like a similar thought process or were they just training because they wanted to get jacked or what was it like back then? So the answer is no. People definitely weren't training with longevity in mind. It was it was fun. It was a really fun time because what what mattered the most to people was how hard could you train. Like it was all about intensity. You never heard any discussions on overtraining. Never. You would never walk into a gym and train hard and have someone go, man, I'm a little afraid I'm going to get overtrained if I keep training like this. Never. It was never a part of any discussions. And in many, many ways, it taught us um, – where the line was, you, you know, I have this saying, you never know where the line is until you cross it a little. Yeah. And I, I don't think a lot of people even know where that line is. So they don't even know what they're capable of. They have no idea how hard you can even push, you know, and nowadays you have a lot of people saying, Oh, don't do anything to failure. Oh, don't go too hard. They're like making all these excuses to not train hard. And, you know, I have yet to see someone reach their potential without training really hard. You know, the, the question just becomes, how do you do it intelligently and not hurt yourself? So back then it was all about, man, let's just get in and pound. And I was, a, I did some powerlifting too. And uh, it was the same thing there. It was like, how strong can you get as quick as you can? And then we'll see what happens. But bodybuilding was um, in the late eighties and in the early nineties and nineties, it was all about, man, get in there and bust your butt. The gym culture itself was was different. You know, you had all the kind of the old school gyms. Those were options in most places. And now that's not so much available to a lot of people. There's, yeah. there's still gyms like that out there, but there's not nearly as many. And the culture is very different. You know, if you walked into a gym in the 90s and you saw somebody just sitting there on the bench looking at a, a probably a flip phone back then, some kind of phone or something and sitting there for 20 minutes, 
you'd, you'd grab them and throw, throw them off the bench. Like, Hey, I want to use this. And nowadays when you walk to the gym, like everybody's sitting on their phone. And yeah. so it's a, it's a different culture. Um, the culture was much more hardcore, tough, tough, tough culture, small groups of people training, trying to outdo each other, supporting each other, pushing each other. You know, you get a lot of people now, I don't see these groups like just pushing each other, people pushing each other as much as I used to see either. Now it's kind of just every man for himself with their headphones, with their phones, not really yeah. pushing. So it's a little different now. And like I said, you know, there's still great gyms out there. I, I travel and I go to them actually, but it's not nearly as common as it used to be. Absolutely. So if you were to think about right now, you train with, as you said, in an intelligent manner for longevity, maybe perhaps you're looking at, you know, maximum recoverable volume, how many sets you can recover for. Do you think that how you developed as a bodybuilder back then, if you had that same approach, would be different or do you think your progress would be the same? That is a great question. That's an awesome question. And I really don't know. Um, I really don't know because I don't, as hard as I train, and believe me, 99.9% of stuff I did, most people wouldn't be able to do. I still think my body could handle it and it did pretty well. So I'm not going to, you know, and I did some pretty high volume work back then. Like I remember our leg workouts were, you know, two hours of just pounding, right? Um, I, I think I probably would have limited my volume a little bit. I don't know that I would have changed my intensity though, because you know, we hear like if you ask a panel of experts, if you say, what's the number one way for you to grow muscle? They're all going to tell you the same thing. They're all going to say progressive overload, every single one of them. So then I go. So then I say to them, OK, explain to me how you're going to use progressive overload if you never even come close to failure, if you're always leaving reps in a tank. Like yeah. explain to me how you're going to get better if you've always got this gap of reps you're leaving in a tank. I don't know, John. How do you do that? I don't know. You tell me. You're the one that's saying never go to failure. Don't push that hard. But then you're just parroting what everybody else is saying, which is, well, it's progressive overload. Well, the last time I checked, progressive overload is you got to push a little harder, whether it be weight or reps or something. And if you continue to do that, you're eventually going to get to the point where you're training really hard. Yeah. It's going to happen. So I think a lot of people talk without even thinking what their answers are. You know, like – you know, there's this, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, there's this, uh, there's a guy named Chris Beardsley, who, who's, uh, I believe he's over by you guys. I believe he's in the UK. Maybe he's in England. And he talks about the last five reps of your sets being re really, really important, um, particularly the last five reps. And the last rep be meaning failure or just close to it, like within a rep or two of failure. Okay. Now, I look at that and I go, yeah, of course. Of course, those reps are important. Like, that's when you're pushing yourself. But we have people saying, well, I don't know about that philosophy. I don't know if it's really the last five reps. Like, okay, here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to do a single set where you come within five reps of failure. Now, I want you to train like that all the time. I want you to report back to me how much progress you make. Yeah. It doesn't make sense, right? People outscience themselves. Yeah. They outscience themselves. Like, Progressive overload. Okay, how are you going to do progressive overload if you're not coming within five reps of failure? Yeah. Like, explain to me how you're going to program that. And you can give me all the mathematical equations. Well, I did this percentage. And listen, I want to tell you, you're not going to reach your full potential. It ain't going to happen because you're scared of hard work. You're trying to justify it with science when there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who make great progress by doing, guess what? Training really hard. <laughs> yeah. 100 dude. I, I love the passion that you speak with because I mean over here in the UK there's there's a, a big sort of movement about hitting failure and it's been been that way the past sort of four or five years I would say since I've been around and um, there is a reps in reserve type model but I always just say how do you know you're too shit, rep shy of failure if you've never went there and, if you never went to failure you might you might think you're too rep shy but you're seven rep shy yeah yeah, hundred percent. And I guess obviously the, the common trait between back then and now is that your intensity has not changed. You've just gotten a lot smarter with perhaps the programming that you do, the specific movements that maybe don't cause you any injuries or whatnot. So yes, you know, if we looked at your your training, was it more 
I guess at that time, a lot of barbell free weights? And is it more sort of now, are you, are you locked into machines? Like you're saying, V-squat or hack squat? Or what would be the difference there? I did do a lot more um, barbell work. Like I did, bar, like I was a big squatter. I love to squat. And, you know, when I was powerlifting, I was up around eight, an 800 pound squat. Um, I did a lot of um, deadlifts. I did, I did a lot of barbell work. And as I got older, um, just honestly, my body started getting beat up. And a barbell squat didn't feel as good as it used to feel when I was 30 years old. You know, I remember having my last good squat workout. Like I remember to this day what it was. It was 2013, and um, I was doing um, safety bar squats. Okay. And I had four four plates and a quarter on there. And I did. I was shooting for like a set of 12. And I remember I did like eight reps. And I remember I felt like a little, like a lightning bolt go through my spine. And I did a couple more reps. I racked it. I thought, man, that didn't feel good. And um, the next probably four or five days, my back hurt so bad. I couldn't even hardly walk. It hurt so bad. And every time I tried to squat after that, it just felt really uncomfortable. It just didn't feel right on my back. And eventually I realized that I could squat. Like I could squat, but I hurt so bad. Um, It wasn't worth it. And squats were my favorite exercise. I probably for a year, I was really down in the dumps. I felt really bad because I couldn't squat with a barbell on my back anymore. Um, Essentially taking my favorite movement away from me. So what did I do? I had to figure out other things to replace it. It might be a machine. It might be a different bar. You know, we have bars now where the bar, you know, like a safety squat bar, for example, the bar doesn't actually sit right on your spine. So it felt better. So you, you have to start to think. You know, and there are a lot of bodybuilders over the years that don't do that. They keep doing the same stuff and then they end up really injured, injured really bad. You know, I've got some friends that won't change their movements and they keep, you know, they get injured. And I'm like, why are you doing that? Well, because I love them. I understand you love them, but at some point you got to, you got to think, is this worth it? It all comes down to one thing, risk versus reward. So you're trying to get this much reward when the risk is this big. Yeah. I would rather you do something where the reward is this big and the risk is only that big. Yeah. You know, so you've got to really look at the exercises. And so to answer your question, I did do more barbell stuff back in the old days. And I think it was a good call. I would still advise people to use a lot of barbells and dumbbells, but I'm also not one of these guys that demonizes machines. Like, like you mentioned the hack squat machine. That is a fantastic machine. I don't care if you're 20 years old or you're 50 years old. Yeah. That's a really good machine. So it just becomes, you know, you start to find machines that work better for you, that don't give you as much connective tissue stress, um, you know, where the reward is much higher than the risk. And at the end of the day, whether you're using a barbell, a dumbbell, or a machine, it comes down to intensity. Like, you know, the nice thing about a machine is you can take them to failure more often. Like, think about a squat going to failure. That's a dangerous proposition if you truly are going to, like, failure. But think about a leg extension. I mean, you can do a leg extension to failure. You can do a leg curl to failure. You have virtually no risk risk for injury. So you can get more intensity out of them safely. Absolutely. So I would never tell somebody, I want you to squat to failure. But like literally you would have, the, the risk would be so high. I would always tell you if you're squatting to leave a rep or two in a tank, even on your hardest sets. Yeah. So machines give you the advantage of allowing you to continue to use very high intensity, but in a safe way. Yeah, I, I love that you said about how it just, you know, it didn't feel good, so you just switched over. Because um, when I, I lived in the States for a year, I, I barbell squatted a lot because it was kind of what you'd done. And I brought that back with me and I continued to do it. However, at six foot three and with really tight adductors and groin, it's never felt good for me. So I, I dropped it about three years ago. And all I've been doing since is hack machine, Smith machine, or a, a type of pendulum sort of squat. Um, and I love how much passion you speak with it all because just like anyone listening, I'm sure that they want to do this for the next sort of 20, 30, 40 years. And, and having you had the experience to say, right, well, this is what we've done and this is what we learned from it, I just think is, is invaluable. But this sort of kind of leads me on to the next question about we, we keep and I keep referencing, you know, throughout your career because I feel that you've got so much value um, that, that could be shared and the experience that you've learned. Um, 
over what we've seen sort of more recently in the UK, as you could say, whether it's to do with science, was a lot of people are more sort of health conscious or bodybuilders are being more conscious of their health, you know, in regards to their blood pressure or getting their blood done or whatnot. And um, when they are sort of on cycle, off cycle and whatnot, was that something that was, was health or that anything like that talked about back in the day? Or was it just a case of you just kind of go on with it and we'll worry about that later? You know, what's funny is people always talked about your liver, like taking care of your liver. That's why you had this supplement. You remember that supplement called Live 52? It was made by a company called Himalaya Healthcare. I've heard, I've heard about it before, yeah. Yeah, I mean, people talked about keeping their liver healthy from all the orals, from the anadrol tabs, the Winstrol tabs and all that. Um, people did talk about taking care, watching your blood pressure. Although I think generally speaking, the attitude was more of, I'm not getting that stuff checked because I'm afraid of what it'll show me. So yeah. it, it was like, it was like more of an ignorance is bliss. Like if I don't know it, then there won't be an issue. And I don't think the guys were nearly as educated as they are now. I think we've made some great improvements now, but I'll also say this the chemical part of the, of the sport has increased dramatically now versus then. Okay. So on one hand, you've got people that are much more careful now, but on the other hand, the chemical use is out of control now. So thank God that people are a little more health conscious because if you took, um, you know, if you didn't take any precautions like the guys pretty much used to in the old days, then you'd be in real trouble now because of how much stuff people take. And the other thing I would say is people took downtime. They were off cycle a lot in the older days and nobody's off cycle. Now you take stuff year round. Yeah. That used to be in eighties and nineties. People would say, you're crazy. Like if you take stuff year round, everybody would say you're nuts. Um, for the most part, there's always exceptions. There's always, you know, like Nasser RIP, the guy would take high doses year round. But for the most part, people were trying to do a PCT cycle to restart their own system where they were taking a little break. Whereas now it doesn't happen. Like once you're on, like people, I'm not coming off. They can't take the one step back to take two forward. They got to, they got to always feel like a monster, right? They can never kind of humble themselves and I, back off. Yeah. I, I love what you just said, because I guess that, that fear of those markers being off was something that a few years ago, probably I, I was like, ignorance is bliss, right? I'll, I won't get it done. Uh, but then one day thought, well, I want to have kids one day. I want to live to see them, blah, blah. And I started to do it. And it's only as I've started to do it that I now, I haven't been off in a while, but I will come down to a physiological dose, a TRT dose within the range and try and get some health markers back in check. But I get really worried when I see, because I'm, I'm someone that's used that for maybe perhaps the past four or five years in regards to not coming off, but trying to strategically be like, well, I'm going to come down to TRT for something like, eight weeks try and yeah. get my lipid profile in a good spot my kidneys right blood cell count etc but you're so right that in today's society and whether it's a uk thing or whether it's all over the world we see guys that are never off and high dosages all year now what i want you to do is the guys that are listening that are doing exactly that what would your advice be to them well there's a couple things that play into this um one of them is very hard for a male to deal with. It's called the male ego, right? It's guys are so consumed, particularly in the age of social media where you're posting pictures on Instagram and doing videos on YouTube. So guys are really, really obsessed with looking good all the time. Yeah. So you've got to, the first thing you got to do is you got to humble yourself. You got to say, you know what? There's going to be a period of time where I'm not quite as big and hard. So you got to come to grips with that. Number one, number one, you got to get humble. Okay. Then number two, there's this philosophy of the more you take, the more you have to take. So, Hey, if I took 800 milligrams of test a week last year, then this year I got to take 1200. Then the next year I got to take 1700. The next year I got to take 2,500. That's a lot. It's a lot. And you know, um, even the guys that were taking mega amounts in like say the nineties, it was still, I don't want to say peanuts, but it was still way less than the guys take now. It's not uncommon now for a pro to take two grams of test in a week. That's not uncommon. It's nuts. That was extremely uncommon in the 90s. Like, you know, I remember working up to 750 milligrams and 
like that was pretty high back then. I was like, okay, but if you tell somebody now, 750 milligrams as high as you want to go, they're like, well, that's not too high. Like, I, you know, the first time I remember the first time I used testosterone, it was, it was a uh, 250 milligrams every 10 days. It was uh, the old Sostanon from Mexico. The only the only guys that would know that's the old guys. And I remember like my body dramatically changing. Yep. And I that's not an ideal way to do it once every 10 days. I understand that. I, I just had no money, so I could only afford six yeah. shots, yeah. right? So I got six shots, and it lasted me 60 days. Well, in that 60 days, my body changed a lot. Yeah. And, I, and I don't think people understand how a little bit can go a long way. And there's factors that go with that. It's how you're eating. There's genetic response. I think I was always a good response. Some people just don't respond as well. But I think there's a certain dose that you get to where anything beyond that, it's just side effects. Like there's nothing positive. If it was a matter of just taking more, then I could just take five grams of tests and I could be in the Mr. I could be top three in Mr. Olympia, right? Wrong. That's not how it works. Your body can only grow so fast. Your genetics only allow so much. Your genetics only respond so much to the chemicals. So it's, you know, so the ultimate is finding a good a dose where you feel good. You don't blow your health. And then you pull back, you get a little healthier, then you do it again. Um, you know, so for me, like, you know, my HRT up until recently was 200 to 250 megs a week. That's what it's been since 2017. I didn't lose hardly any muscle at all. You know, I lost like two pounds. Yeah. And now um, it's 100 megs a week. And... Yeah. I have, I lost like maybe another pound or two and that's it. Like a hundred megs a week. <laughs> that's it. Now I'm not saying everybody else needs to do what I'm doing. I'm just trying to tell you that I think people will be amazed at how well they do. If they train really hard, they work on the recovery and they eat well, like a little bit of the other stuff goes a long way when you've got all the other factors in line first. Yeah. And it's th such a great point because before, before I was really into bodybuilding seriously, uh, I would play a bit with anabolics and I'd read on some forum from some guy called, you know, Big Jimmy, to, that you should take 800 milligrams because that's what you need to take. And I was like, right, cool. But I wasn't, you know, wasn't doing anything with my, my recovery. My nutrition was shit. Everything was shit. And, you know, four years after that, or th you know, back in 2017, I ran, you know, 250 milligrams each head for 12 weeks. And it was like the most muscle I'd ever put on in 12 weeks because I slept like a baby. I valued my macros. And uh, just to hear you say that is, I'm just, if those of you aren't watching on YouTube, I'm sitting here <laughs> just, just nodding along. And I, I think what you said as well about being our genetic predisposition, like I, I know personally, and I'm maybe going to run an experiment this year, that to not put tests that high, because I feel that I've got a predisposition um, that, I need to use, say, aromatized inhibitors, and it always puts my HDL down. And I'm like, well, why not just run test really low, DHT derivatives elsewhere, like something like Primo, and then just kind of see what happens from there. Now, I think that getting blood work and stuff is quite uh, it's quite common here in the UK now. And it, or it, sorry, it is becoming more common. Do you feel that that trend is the same whether it's all over the world or in the US? Or are guys still do they still have this sort of I'm afraid of what it might show or is that trend following the same suit and where you guys are? I think that for the most part, we're headed in the right direction. I do think, um, in America, people are more conscious of it. Um, from what I'm here, the problem is, and what I hear about overseas is a lot of people tell me the HRT clinics and people that provide good advice for HRT is behind. Like, you know, I'll have somebody say in Australia, say, I can't get a doctor to even give me HRT. I've had blood work done and my levels are way below the low threshold and the doctor still won't give me HRT. So there's that stigma with testosterone. And the reality is, is if you do the research, low testosterone puts you at a high risk for myocardial infarction, for heart attacks, for being diabetic, for depression. There's all kinds of, all kinds of literature that talk about side effects of low testosterone. So you would think a doctor who's, bound by treating you and making your life better would say, Hey, you know what? Maybe a little bit of testosterone, maybe we'll help this guy. Yeah. But that's where the other countries are really far behind in America. There's tons of clinics that'll look at your levels and provide you with help. That's 
So I think a lot of people are becoming more aware, but then the actual doctors that help, they're good in America, but other countries, I still think they're behind. I still don't think they're willing to help people that are in situations where they have low testosterone. And that, that's terrible. I have clients from all over the world. I'll have clients where, you know, you, I don't care how good you eat or train. If your hormones are destroyed, you produce hardly any testosterone, you're not going to make any improvements. It ain't going to happen. You can't outrun bad hormones. And like I'll say, you know, send me your blood work and I'll send it to me. And it's terrible. And I'll say, you know, you need help. You know, we need to get a, you need to get a doctor. And they're like, nobody will help me. Nobody will help me. And I hear that over and over and over from various countries. So I think the knowledge is spreading and I think the desire to stay healthy is spreading. I just don't, I still think there's that stigma in some countries where you don't have doctors are willing to work with you. Yeah. You, I think you're hundred percent right. A lot of the time, um, well, over here in the UK, they have, you know, free healthcare, I suppose NHS, but with all the blood work I get done, it's all private through just a private company and you get, you get the blood work back like that. Um, I'll be there. I think what frustrates myself and I don't know if you feel the same is, Guys will be willing to spend, um, you know, say two, three hundred pounds. Okay, well, maybe like say four hundred dollars on a cycle, but then the minute at the end of you know end of their cycle, you say, right, we're going to check some blood work. It's going to cost maybe a hundred dollars, and this is company. They go, oh no way, no way, yeah. I'm not going to do that. And I'm like, it's just so sad, um, yeah, because of the health implications. If you say if you had low cholesterol or HDLs for. 20 odd years you know it's going to be detrimental to your health yeah but um anyway i was going off on a little bit of a tangent there so back 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 in those sort of earlier days of your career was it very common that you would just go on for coming you know dieting down for a show and then straight away you would come off for you know your off season and kind of get healthy or would guys use a little bit off season as well well what happened when i uh the initial years i competed what happened was you would use uh, chemicals to compete, to help you maintain muscle and to get a different look to your muscle. And then when the show was over, you would immediately start your PCT to get your own system back in order. Right. And then you would be off, you'd be clean for a while. So you would you'd PCT it for however long, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, whatever it took to get you normal. Then you would come off of that and you'd have a natural off season. And then you might have, you know, um, an eight week bulk and then a 12 week diet, or you might have a six week bulk and a 12 week diet. Um, or you might just go right into a 12 week diet or 16 week diet or something like that, where you, you see, this is what happened with a lot of guys is, so if you think about that, think about, let's say you compete, let's say you compete at 180 pounds. And then, um, you know, then you, afterwards you, uh, you do your PCT and then your weight probably doesn't change a whole lot because you, you lose maybe a little muscle, but you gain some fat. Then you train natural. So maybe you gain a little bit more fat, but you gain a little bit of muscle. So maybe your body weight goes up to 185, 190, maybe 195. And then you diet and you put the chemicals back in. And now all of a sudden you're, you're got fat coming off, but muscle and strength is improving. So now your body weight doesn't really change a whole lot. Yeah. And then maybe when you're done, you're 188. So you're actually eight pounds heavier than you were the last time. Um, and that's what I used to see a lot of. Um, of course, there were guys. I mean, of course, there were guys that did the heavy headlocks in the offseason. Um, and, and I'm not even saying not to do that. I'm just telling you it was a real interesting approach. And that is really the approach that I took for probably the last six, seven years. My offseason weight would be 225 to 227. And my true competitive weight would be like 223. Right. So I'd start my diet at 225 and then four weeks later, I'd say here, now here I am at 225 and it would look totally different. Yeah. And then another four weeks later, I'd say now here I am at 224 and that looked totally different. Yeah. Um, but it was because it was a little different philosophy. Uh, and I got to the point where as I got older, I didn't want to weigh a whole lot. You know, as you get 40 years old, like your goal shouldn't be to weigh a ton. Like you don't want that stress on your heart. And like, listen, I've had a heart attack. I'm very aware of strain on your heart. Now, mine was from a blood clot, but um, I always thought, I always get worried when I hear the guys that are older saying they want to balk and gain a bunch of weight. I'm like, man, your heart doesn't like that, you know, especially if it's a lot of muscle because it has to drive so much blood flow to your muscle. But it was a little different philosophy back then. And 
I remember I didn't even do an actual, like, we'll call it balk in the off season until I was well into my twenties. Um, I had already won probably five, six contests with the other philosophy that I told you about. Yeah. I never even used testosterone until I had won, until I had won our state title. Um, so it was a different approach. You don't really see that nowadays. Um, I like the approach. Um, now, certainly after you compete long enough, you get to the point, and this is probably where you're at in addition to me, after so many years of doing it, you just kind of have to do the HRT. You can't just come off because your own system won't restart. And I tell people when they're starting going down that road, I'm just, okay, you're, at some point, your own system will shut off. It will happen if you keep doing cycle after cycle after cycle. It will happen eventually. Even if you're smart and you're doing small cycles, eventually it'll catch up to you and you know eventually guys get to that point and then you can't really come off all the way then you have to do hrt yeah 100 percent, dude and i think that it it can always be that sense of the minute you come up the minute you go on you're never off and and that's what i'll always say to guys that are thinking about it that or it's very very hard until until you value longevity and health and maybe perhaps a family um, but you know science has kind of came a long way in the sense of guys are able to, to run something like HMG whilst on cycle at a TRT dose, boost their FSH and, you know, be able to conceive with their partner, um, which is something that was always a worry of mine years ago. And so it kind of, it's came on that way. But what I wanted to say is just from what you said there, I, I think that I speak for everyone here in Scotland and the UK, um, that we're all so glad that you're doing well after that heart attack that wasn't too long ago. Um, and it was just amazing to see, yeah, you know how how positive you are um, in general day to day life, but also just the passion you speak with on the podcast is unbelievable. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to to tell the listeners that maybe don't know much about you that not only have you been through that, you've overcome the odds. Uh, there was a time in your career where you actually overcame a, a very serious uh, you know, disease within the colon, um, and, and which after which you actually earned your pro card. I'm sure it was a few years later. But what I wanted to, you to do, if you could, um, I know we're kind of nearing time here, is just give the listeners you know, what it was like to kind of go through that. But then when you actually achieved that pro card, was it all that more sort of bittersweet having been through it? Um, just your whole sort of thoughts on the experience. Yeah. So in 2005, I was getting ready for the Mr. USA. And I was coming off a fourth place finish at the Mr. North America the year before. Um, so I was really excited about the 2005 Mr. USA. I thought I had a good shot at placing really high. And about four weeks out, I started having really bad stomach pain in the mornings. I'd be out doing my morning cardio and my stomach would hurt really bad. It got worse and worse and worse. And it got to the point where it was every time I would eat, I would be curled up in a ball, um, on the ground because it hurts so bad. In the last probably two weeks for the show, my my food would be like two ounces of fish and like a handful of oatmeal. That would be a whole meal because I couldn't put anything in me. Anyways, um, a lot of medical tests, a lot of bad diagnoses of things that they said I had that I didn't have, um, in which I knew it just from the medical background I have. I knew I knew they were off, but I didn't know what I had, and nobody really knew what I had. And then. Um, Essentially what happened, like to boil it down, really what happened was I had a blood clot in the sigmoid part of my colon in um, a mesentery vein is what really what happened. And the blood clot stopped the blood flow until that vein literally exploded and I was bleeding to death. So luckily I was in the hospital and that happened. So afterwards they sent some, a biopsy part of the, the tissue because um, I immediately had to have surgery because I was bleeding to death. In the Mayo Clinic here, it's a very prestigious clinic. They did a biopsy and they, they saw what it was and then they told me what it was called. Idiopathic myoentomal hyperplasia of the mesenteric vein for people who are curious. Right. But anyways, when I looked that up and I read the um, side effects, I was like, that's what I had. That's exactly right. Everything they say is exactly what happened. So it was kind of a blood clot related thing. And so I woke up in intensive care in the ICU unit with tubes in me all over. They removed my entire colon. Um, if you understand the way the colon works, it reabsorbs salt and water out of your stool. It hydrates you. So I'm, I, I get dehydrated very easy now. That's why my cheekbones are always sticking out. Um, 
so it was scary. I, um, I ended up having multiple surgeries that, that essentially destroyed the linea alba in between my abs and the fascia tissue. So I had to get another special reconstructive, reconstructive surgery to sew my abs together, to hold them together. Right. And that was in 2006 by the time all the surgeries were done. Yep. Um, actually, the special surgery was, I think, in 2008. So, um, you know, I pretty much thought winning a bodybuilding show was over. Like it was never going to happen. A pro qualifier, I should say. I didn't think I'd ever win a pro qualifier, but I kept training because I loved to train. And I kept studying nutrition. I kept working hard and I started improving. I like, like, wow, I'm actually in some ways better than I was before. In some ways I wasn't, you know, now I had scars all over my stomach. My stomach didn't look as good, but in a lot of ways I looked, I actually got better. So I got back on stage and I worked my way up and, um, 2012, I got second place in a pro qualifier. 2013, I got second place. 2014, I think it was, I got second place. And then 2015, I got my pro card. So, you know, when all that happened to me in 2005, you know, the thought was, I just hope I can lift weights again. You know, I just hope I can train hard. It wasn't, I got to get my pro card. I got to get my pro card. It was just, I just want to be able to train hard and feel healthy. That was my only goal. Yeah. So to go from that to actually winning a pro card was extremely gratifying. It, um, I had a lot of support. I had a lot of good people around me. Um, I think that was key. I also, I also just never gave up. I don't know how else to say it. I just, I'm a fighter. Like yeah. I fought my whole life. Um, I've had to fight my whole life and I just, I just, just kept going and I kept getting better and, and I kept getting better and better. And then people started noticing me like, man, this is amazing. This dude was almost dead. Now look at him. Yeah. So, so it was pretty amazing. And, you know, I felt very, very good afterwards. Um, the heart attack I had, so I told you it was a blood clot. So, you know, the first thing I thought, well, not the first thing, but it, when it was all over with, I just kept thinking back to the 2005, it was a really essentially a blood clot too. So, you know, uh, I have some abnormalities with my blood. There's never that, 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 uh, that disease that I described to you, idiopathic myoentomal hyperplates mesenteric vein. There's no other bodybuilder in the world that has that ever. That's never happened to a bodybuilder ever. So you can't say, well, John was doing this and this is what gave it to him. This is no, it, this has never happened to another bodybuilder. I'm the only one in the world that's ever had this happen. Yeah. So there's some unique physiology that I have. Um, when I had that done, um, they even did some tests on my heart back then. And then I had continued to have tests on my heart just because I'm always want to make sure. I mean, I had a calcium score test done like three or four years ago that looks at hard black in your arteries, in your heart. So then when I had the heart attack from the blood clot, they did more tests on my heart. They put the camera back down on my heart. They, um, they did a, they took me to, it's called a cath lab and they put it basically a tube in your brachial artery and they run it all the way up. They run it all the way up your arm into your chest. They can see soft plaque. And that's actually how they bring the camera up and they could see the clots in the first place. Said I didn't have any soft plaque, no hard plaque, very little bit, a tiny amount, um, which is normal for somebody my age. Heart size was normal, so I didn't have this gigantic heart. Um, so it's like, man, it's frustrating. I do all these things, and this blood clot comes out of nowhere and gets me. So I'm on blood thinners now. I'll probably be on blood thinners the rest of my life. I probably should have been on blood thinners after 2005. But that disease, if you look it up, it's really rare. It's very rare. Right. And that wasn't me saying I have this. That was the Mayo Clinic, which is the top clinic maybe in the whole United States. So yeah. they're the ones that said I had it, not me. I didn't get on Google and go, oh, I figured out what it is. Yeah. So I feel very good about their diagnosis. And when I researched that, like every single case, the side effects, the pain, it was a dead on ringer to what I had. So I feel 100% confident that the Mayo Clinic got it right. So I probably should have been on some kind of blood thinner back then. I don't know. It's kind of hard to say, but I've made a really, really good recovery. That happened on May 11th. I took 16 days off the gym um, and then it took me, I want to say about six weeks to start feeling really good. 
So um, May into the June, and now like the last three or four weeks, I felt amazing. And just to kind of wrap this all up, next Wednesday, a week from today, I go to get my echocardiogram done so they can see the ejection fraction in the heart, how well it's functioning and all that. So I'm hoping that they, I do that and they go, you're good to go, you're great. And I'm ho I, hopefully I'm cleared, like I'm good to go. Yeah, that's so inspirational to hear you talk about everything that you've been through and to achieve what you've achieved within the, within the sport of bodybuilding is, is awesome. Um, before you go, one thing I'd like to ask all listeners is just, I guess it's probably from those two experiences. I, I often ask you what the biggest lesson in life is that you've learned and any advice you would share from that. Um, does that come directly from what you've overcome health-wise or is there something else? Um, lessons I've learned, man, man there's so many. Um, I got like 15 things popping in my head. If there was a main, let me, the most let me just, let me just run through some of them for you. So, um, when I had the thing happen to me in 2005, my, I, they were actually wheeling me into emergency surgery. I was in shock and I was, I was sure I wasn't going to wake up. I was sure I was going to die just based on the amount of blood I'd lost. And the only thing that kept going through my mind was my friends and my family. Like, man, I'm really going to miss my friends. I'm going to miss my family, which, you know, mostly at the time was my wife. And um, that made a real big impression on me, like to value your friendships, to value your family. And I think like if you think about just on a big scale, what can you do to make the world a better place? It starts right with your family, man. It starts right there. Just establishing a, a good family, supporting each other, maybe sometimes being hard on each other, being tough on your kids, things like that, but doing it out of love, right? Like that's where every problem that is, exists in the world, you can improve it by just starting at home with the family and how you raise your kids and how you guys interact. So that was a lesson. Another lesson I had was more related to work. So when I eventually went back to work, a lot of the things that were big deals to me were no longer that big of a deal. It was like, you know, is there anybody's, like, I remember I worked at a bank um, and I was running projects. So, you know, we would have an issue come up and I would say, well, is there anybody's accounts being affected? Is somebody losing money? No. Okay. We'll come back in the morning. We'll fix it. We don't need to stay here all night. Yeah. Not that big of a deal. Right. Whereas before it was like, oh my God, we got to fix this. Oh, you know. So it really changed my temperament in dealing with issues um, just in general, you know. And it was a real good lesson. And I, got, I refer back to it a lot right now because right now we're in the cult, the, we're in outrage culture. Everybody wants to be outraged about something. Everybody wants to be a victim of some kind. Everybody wants to point the finger at somebody else. But this is truly an outrage culture. It's like the news weaponizes your emotions. Like they manipulate your emotions to get you to feel strongly about something, but they don't give you actual evidence and facts and data. So all these people are running around really mad about stuff. And there's really nothing to be that mad about. It's like, listen, we have a long way to go as a country to get better. But the picture that is being painted for you is not reflective of what's really happening. And this is the fault of the news media, right? This is the fault of the news media. They try to, they, for them, it's all about ratings. How can we get the best ratings? And the way they can get the best ratings is to make polarizing statements, to turn people against each other, to take data and forget about it and turn it into some kind of narrative to make people mad at each other. And that's what they do. They just pit people against each other. So this outrage culture, if people would, go through what I went through, they would think, you know what, let me look at the evidence. Let me see if this is really a big deal. Yeah. Now, to be clear, there are things that are a big deal that you should get outraged about. But what I see is nine out of 10 things people are outraged about. There's like no data to even back up why they're mad. It's like, <laughs> like you're, you guys are angry just to be angry. You know, that doesn't make you virtuous just to be angry all the time. Yeah. You know, we all have things we believe in, we stand up for, and we should, we should. Yeah. But if you're going to get angry and be part of the outrage culture, just make sure that there's something you're actually angry about that makes sense. <laughs> All right. 100%. Now, I know you're short for time, so what I'm going to ask you to do, um, you've shared so many, so much knowledge, bonds, and value this whole episode. But for anyone out listening there that wants to get in touch with you, maybe perhaps follow you on Instagram, check your website, uh, could, could you give them your details? Yeah, so my YouTube is Mountain Dog one 
and my Instagram is Mountain Dog One, and my website is MountainDogDiets.com. So I'm um, I'm very easy to find. Um, I get a lot of messages. I try to get back with most of them, but honestly, I can't keep up with all of them. Um, but I do my I do my best. <laughs> yeah, I, I do my and, best. And you know what? I was so I am still to this day so thankful um, when I sent off the original email um, to ask you to come on for an episode. I didn't expect a reply, and you got back to me for like fairly quickly. And I just want to say for myself and all the listeners, uh, thank you for coming on today, but also just thank you for everything that you do for the industry, everything you've done over the years, and just being sort of a, a pillar and a beacon for everyone to look up to. Um, it's truly inspiring. It really, really thank is. you. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Not a problem. So anyone listening, wherever you are, whatever you do, I think I can speak for me and John when I say, give it the beans.